First, I'd like to uh, say something to uh, all of you about Sanson. Sanson is the global leader in environmentally friendly wood protection. Since 1986, they have been focused on creating the best performing, most beautiful waterborne wood finishes in the world. Sanson's innovative research and development program has made them the leader in developing environmentally friendly alternatives to tra traditional wood coatings and preservatives. With a growing network of dealers around Canada, the United States, Western Europe, and Russia, Sanson and Viro stains are becoming the choice for customers who demand the absolute best in performance and beauty for their homes around the world. Sanson believes that every day their passion drives them to find ways to protect wood better. That every day they work with their clients to meet and anticipate the needs of their clients better. That every day at Sanson, they work to fulfill the promise of naturally, naturally perfect wood protection. Tonight, our, our, uh, the uh, title of our presentation is Log and Timbers, Best Practices with Sanson and Davidson Log and Timber Artisans. Michael Lobodzinski, Senior Business Development Manager at Sanson, is dedicated to working with log and timber builders across Ontario and the United States on coding systems for, for beautifying and protecting log and timber structures. And Matt Davidson is owner at Davidson Log and Timber Artisans in Ontario. Davidson Log and Timber Artisans handcrafts log and, and timber frames in Ontario, Canada, and across the world. So uh, please uh, join me in welcoming Sanson and Davidson Log and Timber Artisans for our, our, our presentation tonight. Thank you. Okay, guys, you're on. Thank you, Mac. Just had to unmute us. All right, can everybody hear us loud and clear? All right, wonderful. So uh, welcome everyone. Tonight's a special night and uh, Matt has invited me to uh, to his home um, in, uh, where exactly are we? Washago, Ontario. Washago, Ontario. So uh, my name's Michael. I'm Matt. Matt. And uh, thank you for the very professional introduction, Mac. And uh, hopefully we can, uh, you know, have a nice relaxing evening together and talk a little bit about uh, best practices when it comes to prep and application. We'll talk a little bit about a product or our products as well too. And uh, Matt's going to share some nice projects with us and some insight as to, you know, his experiences with the product. So um, we wanted to kick it off with um, uh, a little video that Matt prepared previously. So. Mac, I think you have that loaded up. If you're able to uh, go ahead and load it, we'll start with that. Thank you. Welcome to Davidson Log and Timber Artisans. I'm Matt Davidson. I'm gonna take you for a tour of our log home building yard where we build handcrafted log homes. We do Scandinavian full scribe, full scribe dovetails, and the traditional chink style dovetail. We do piece on piece. We also do crock framing. It's the middle of April in Ontario. And what that means for us is we have one house that's ready to ship usually. And we also have multiple loads of winter cut Eastern white pine that we need to get the bark stripped off. Our premium eastern white pine logs are sustainably harvested in cuts approved by the Ministry of Natural Resources. All our handcrafted homes are pre-built right here in our log yard, one home at a time. My wife Allie and I started this business in 2000 
with a quest to offer different styles of classic log construction that other people just weren't doing. Apart from the classic styles we do, like the Scandinavian scribe, the piece on piece, our Norwegian dovetail, or our live edge timber framing, we attribute our success to style, skill, but above all, integrity. Our focus is and always has been to provide classic log and timber structures that are built with the very best products. I don't believe there's any other type of home construction where you can actually see the tremendous amount of work that went into every aspect of that home. There are log and timber structures in Europe that are a thousand years old. There is absolutely no reason why the home we build you cannot last the same. For your log or timber structure to become a legacy that will be passed down from generation to generation, it's going to require solid design principles and a routine maintenance schedule. And I mean, really, if you're not willing to commit to that, really, what's the point? Design principles, craftsmanship, and wood protection. I look forward to speaking with you about your legacy structure and how we can work together to make it happen. Talk to you soon. Um, anyways, we wanted to kick off uh, talking about best practices, um, surface prep application. Got a couple examples to show you. Hoping to take about 20 minutes or so to, uh, to work through this. And um, if you have more time for us, you know, we're happy to take the next hour, hour and a half, if you like and really get into it. We really have a lot of product um, to talk about, a lot of information. I think Matt has a lot of experience to share as well too, um, not just about Sanson, but just, just in general working you know, out in the yard. So um, you started this when you were 27, you said, right? Yeah, 27. Mm -hmm. Yeah, going on, uh, going on. <laughs> going on 49. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> nice. So you've been doing this for quite a while. So yeah, so we wanted to kick off with uh, prep and application and um, we, we really encourage you to stick around to the end here because we'd love to engage with you in some q and I'm sure you have some questions about preparation, about application, maybe also about specific products. So we'd be happy to go through it all. So um, yeah, so let's, uh, let's first talk about prep and application. So why is it important? Why, why should we focus so much on prepping the surface of the wood? And I can tell you that um, really, if you're looking at the best performance possible out of any Sanson product or any product for that matter, it's all in the preparation, it's all in the application. So we certainly make a best in class product, but it's absolutely critical that, that you have a great surface to work with so that product can perform the way it's designed. And um, we really promote 60 to 80 grit prep sand um, on just about any kind of surface when we're working with our uh, exterior penetrating products, whether it be the classic, or the SDF. Um, so I wanted to show you the difference sanding makes. So we have a pre piece here right in front of us that we, pre we prepared uh, earlier today, uh, right out of the yard. And uh, this side right here wasn't sanded. You can see that there's a little bit of a, a sheen to it or a luster. I'm gonna pitch it a little bit here. And hopefully you can see um, that there's a bit of a sheen here. Hopefully you can see that from where you are. Okay, in most cases, um, what you'll see is um, either mill glaze marks from the planing or just simply, you know, a surface that's sort of glazed because it's tightened up um, over time. Um, we know that if you wait more than two weeks after sanding the surface that basically you can lose about 50% of the adhesion of the coating. Um, sanding the surface allows the product to penetrate evenly and it promotes uh, color uniformity and also even wear. It makes a tremendous difference of course, in the, in the product and the life cycle of the product. And most importantly, it drives out the maintenance coat period, how long you have to wait between maintenance coats and preventative maintenance coats. And quite frankly, I think the most important uh, factor is how easy it is to maintain afterwards as well. So a, a well-prepared surface, a well-applied product means that really in, uh, at that point where you need to do the, the preventative maintenance coat, you should only have to wash the surface and apply the product. So um, without further ado, let me demonstrate how, how much of a difference that makes. I'm just going to put that right there. Yeah. So I'm just simply using some water here on the surface of this piece. Once again, this side's not sanded. This side was sanded earlier today. We think we used 60 grit. 60 grit. Yeah. So uh, here we go. Just going to apply just some normal tap water. 
to the surface and you should see it taking whereas this side will um, basically uh, allow that 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 bead of water to just sit there in that spot and um, the sanded side that? yeah go for it bring it over you might have to unplug it Matt, to to show us a little bit better hopefully you can see how it's starting to spread into the wood grain right here whereas this side where it hasn't been sanded is just there's there's a lot of surface tension and it's just basically sitting there not moving to the grain here you can see the product spreading out and uh, and eventually it'll work its way into the wood so once again what that means for for your client is that the absorption into the wood in a wear more evenly yeah, so we're focusing on this area right here where there's wood and then if you focus over here you can see how it's already spread out and it's taking into the wood grain so it makes quite a big difference and here we're just using water to to, to demonstrate this perform over time so um, I can't stress enough how how important that is. We want to promote uh, a beautiful, durable surface. So we're getting a little bit of feedback from somebody over there. Um, but we, we want to promote um, a beautiful, durable surface. And we're all in the business of a professional wood care and finishing and making wood look as beautiful as I can. Uh, this is your calling card, right? So these projects are out there in the field. And um, these are your business cards. These are your legacy projects that future customers will look at and, uh, and potentially, you know, high project. And, uh, and, it, and, and really the first thing that you see is the, is the beauty of the wood. If the coating's peeling off because of poor prep or if that step was missed, then, you know, it really, um, it doesn't do the wood justice. So uh, I think there's a bit of a, a reluctance maybe in our community, in the wood, care community in, in terms of maybe, you know, focusing so much on the, um, on the craft and on the building and maybe just leaving the staining up to the contractor or the customer afterwards. Well, staining is not fun. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Builders don't want to stay. <laughs> Fair enough. You know, it's a little bit extra work, but, yeah. but that's a good point. You know, if, if you're willing to add the value, then there's no reason why you can't make that, um, that profit on, on the prep work as well too. So, you know, if you're putting in an extra hundred hours, that's not, uh, that's not lost, uh, um, and a lost expense. You're, you, you can, no, you, you can definitely gain it back. Yeah. yeah you, you get paid for it. Right. So, uh, you know, I, I don't given the cost of the project. Um, I mean, doing the prep work could amount to maybe a single percentage of the cost of the total project. So. Yeah. Like if we have a, a large, house that we've torn down we adds it we spray it and the spraying like we use the foundation you know that's dry within 40 minutes and we mm -hmm. can move it out move it out of the shed out into the yard we don't have to worry about it looks good yeah and uh it's uh, easier to keep clean when we ship it right yeah yeah and from a customer's perspective you know there might be some reluctance to pay for that as well too when when they're uh, considering the total cost of the project. But I think it's important for them to understand and to know that um, when it comes to doing that maintenance coat, there's a lot less work involved as well too. So the small expense of doing it properly the first time around on the first um, round of application, it pays for itself in the end because your maintenance or the cycle between uh, coatings is much longer and you're not having to prep as much. It's a lot less prep. Yeah, as long as they understand that it's part of the uh, process of maintaining their wood, mm -hmm. they're happy to pay for it. Yeah, exactly. So I think there's a little bit of education involved there. There's a, there's certainly a value proposition. You can definitely uh, speak to the durability and to the beauty of really preparing the surface properly. So, um, you know, it's definitely worth it. And mm -hmm. I think we should all refocus on that and, and, um, and understand that there's just a little bit of education involved there. So if we can take the time to educate the customer, it's 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 worthwhile. So mm -hmm. yeah, um, back to this piece here. Hopefully, Matt, if you can pitch the camera down, we can really see how much of a difference it, it's made now in the last few minutes. So um, 
you know, this piece right here, once again, this product or the water is just sitting on here, not really moving into the wood. And yet on the sanded piece, it's really started to spread out and now it's sucking into the wood. So um, just imagine if you're using a coating, you know, ours happens to be a waterborne, waterborne technology. It's using water as the vehicle. You know, imagine not sanding the wood and the, and the coatings just sitting on the surface, whereas here it's allowing it to penetrate in, evenly into the surface of the wood. You're going to see much more performance out of uh, the coating when it's been prepared properly. So hopefully I've convinced you that uh, sanding is worthwhile because not only are you going to increase the durability and the performance, but you can actually profit from that process as well too. And a customer um, has uh, all the benefit as well too because they're going to see longer maintenance cycle and less work when it comes to the maintenance coat. So we're going to move into some of the products and proper applications. So what I wanted to start off with was the the classic, Matt had mentioned the foundation. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm going to show you what the foundation looks like on a piece of timber here that we prepared. So on this piece here, we had applied the classic foundation. So what is classic? Classic 123 is a system that's designed for log and timber applications. It's a system that can really work well with, with wood that has a high, high moisture content. I mean, we all know that, you know, a fresh log could have over 200% moisture content, it's saturated with water, and uh, it really needs to breathe over time. Using a system like Classic helps the wood uh, slowly um, stabilize and equalize over time. You're allowing that moisture to come out of the wood in a controlled fashion. And so the benefit is that you're mitigating the cracking and the checking. You have a much more uniform log um, once the wood has dried and acclimatized. And, um, and, and we're allowing the wood to breathe. You're not trapping the moisture in. So um, very uniquely formulated product to achieve those um, benefits. So the foundation, Matt likes to use foundation as a first coat. I'll explain that a little bit more. The foundation is uh, a system that allows for more color uniformity. Um, it can also be used uh, in place of classic one to achieve lighter color. So really it's a tool to um, achieve uniformity, lighter colors, because it's really the, the first coat in the system of, of the coating. And foundation comes in, in, in colors that match the species of wood. So if you might be working with pine, um, which Matt does, yep. we have a light wood version of it. We also have a cedar version and a fir version. So you can really tailor the foundation to the species of wood that you're using. In this case here, I have a piece of fir that I prepared in advance and use the foundation fir. So really, I mean, this is, if I, you know, just showed you this side of the wood here that was coated, you would think that there's really nothing on there. I mean, yeah. you can see a bit of a difference, but the whole function here is that we're gonna be achieving a much more uniform color. And also we can achieve a little bit of a lighter color tone as well too, using the foundation. So I'm gonna go ahead and apply the classic one on the bare wood and over top of the foundation, just to show you how much of a difference it, uh, it actually makes. Hopefully it makes a big enough difference that we can see it on camera. And you use the foundation for your first coat. Right. Yeah, go ahead and speak to that and uh, while I apply the, the classic one there. So I haven't tried the uh, foundation on Scandinavian style, but uh, we've used it a couple times on timber frames. And what we liked about it, once we finished all our joinery, we sanded it, we sprayed the foundation on with a, uh, you know, just a, yeah, basically a weed sprayer. And, uh, you know, it dries in 40 minutes. And then we were able to just move it out of the yard. We didn't have to worry about it. So that super impressed me with it. Uh, when we shipped it, you know how you always get the strap marks? Uh, the strap marks cleaned off really easy. Um, yeah, it was, you know, it was probably the best frame I, best looking frame I ever delivered the first time I used that stuff. Nice. So I can see the difference already. Yeah. Yeah, you can see where the foundation was applied. So Matt, if you can pitch the camera back down here so we can see this a little bit better. So once again, the foundation, the objective is to achieve uh, a lighter color tone and also better color uniformity. So this is where the foundation was applied. And hopefully you can see how much more uniform that looks there and actually the lighter color tone. Here we can see the classic one applied on bare wood. So a little bit more saturated, a little bit more color intense, 
this may look a little bit more blotchy potentially, but here we have, you know, total color uniformity. So uh, once again, this is a tool to achieve lighter color tone, more uniformity, and um, you know, you can really see it working right now. So there you go. Okay. So classic two and classic three in the system are formulated to achieve um, more ease of application. So it has a certain viscosity to it where you can apply it on a vertical surface. It's not going to run. Um, some of you might have been used to our old classic system, which was really great. And we were able to take it to the next level with classic two and three. So thicker viscosity makes it easier to work with on a vertical surface. We're also using more solids. It's just a more advanced product. And we really developed it to, uh, to, to benefit the, the log and timber that we're applying it to. So I'm going to go ahead and apply some of the classic two on the bare wood here. Actually, you know what I did? Haha, <laughs> I applied classic one yesterday on this side and allowed it to dry. So we have classic one applied to half the board and I'm gonna apply the classic two over top right here just to show you what that looks like. So I think um, hopefully you can appreciate the slightly thicker viscosity of the classic two. So once again, if you're working on a vertical surface, then you can uh, work with the product a little bit easier. It's not running everywhere. It's a little bit more easy. It's a little easier to control. Really goes on very, very nicely, easy to use. And there's no smell to it. No. Yeah. Should add that you can spray it too. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Unless you like brushing for days. Yeah. So here we're using a, a nice six inch <laughs> Corona brush with a China bristle. We actually have these available uh, if you can't find them because these are actually quite hard to find. And, and using a high quality brush like the Corona bristle brush um, with the Chinax, uh, I mean, it makes a big difference. You could use one of these brushes for potentially, I don't see why you couldn't use it for a couple of years, if not longer, if you really take care of it and wash it out after, um, after using it. I've personally used some cheaper brushes and um, they, were, they were pretty much spoken for by the end of the job after day one. So it makes a big difference, yeah. And you're going to leave these four brushes. Here, right? <laughs> we'll do it. There'll be a draw prize. <laughs> so here we go. We have classic one already applied nice and dry. All right. And then we applied classic two over top here. And you can, I, I hope you can appreciate that it's not running down this piece right here. It was really easy to work with, has a thicker viscosity to it. So um, really nice product to work with on, uh, on a logger timber package. So that's classic two. And then classic three is the final coat in the system. And you'll find that the coloration in the classic three is going to be uh, less than the classic one and classic two, because by the time you get to the third coat, you typically don't need as much color. The pigment loading will come by way of the first coat. The second coat will have, um, if not as much as classic one, in some cases, some of the colors will have half as much pigmentation. And then by the time you get to the third coat, you're looking at um, less pigment loading. And we're really focusing on getting those solids onto the wood and really filling in the remaining pores of the wood. So here we have uh, classic three. Just bear with me as I get a clean brush. All right, so classic three. So once again, I can hope you appreciate how much more vis viscosity there is on, on, on the, in the product. I'm going to try and do two things at once here, Matt. We can flip this over. There you go. And I'll just apply it to the bare wood. So you can see, you should be able to notice how much lighter the color is by the time you get to classic three. And uh, depending on which color you're using, you know, that'll be variable. But uh, in this case, we're using a popular color called autumn gold. I think you can see how much less pigment loading there is here compared to the classic two. And once again, because you're using that as a third coat, you don't need as much coloration in it. So what we're doing is filling in the remaining wood grain with the, um, the high solids of the, of the classic three system. So there we go. That's uh, classic one, two, three. Yeah. That's awesome. It's our favorite for uh, log and timber applications. All right, so the next product that I wanted to touch on is our TimberTech um, and seal and also our TimberTech C20 product. So um, if you want to pull open uh, this, the TimberTech C20 there, Matt, and I move this board out of the way. 
Okay. So our TimberTech C20 is our yard sealer. So at this time of year, um, you know, it's starting to get warm. You have probably a pile of logs in the yard. And uh, Matt, I think you had what, uh, eight truckloads this, yeah. this spring, right? Yep. So you're gonna have a number of, uh, of logs there that are gonna be waiting to be processed. And this is the time to think about protecting that wood um, against blue staining, against uh, the UV damage that might happen while that log is in the yard. So you really wanna focus on protecting that investment. And really there's no better product to do that than the C20 because quite frankly, this has a technology that allows it to stay in the wood. It doesn't leach out. So, I mean, those logs are in the yard. They're hopefully on a lift, a couple feet off the ground on a gravel base where it's really allowing the wood to dry properly. Hopefully facing prevailing winds with a little hood over top of the wood to protect it. In a perfect world. Yeah, okay. Yours <laughs> look pretty good though. I was impressed. You had a nice, uh, you had a nice stack out there. Yeah, we try to keep them at least two feet off the ground, yeah. over gravel. Good. And uh, as long as you have the room, you can keep the prevailing winds going through them. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Yeah. So the timber tech is going to help with the um, just preserving that log. And, and really, this is going to save you time and money because timber tech C20 or M30 will help minimize the amount of prep work that's going to be necessary when you're ready to process that log. So, Matt, you've been using this for quite a while, eh? The timber tech? Yeah. So, as soon as the logs are peeled, We'll spray them with a weed sprayer. You back brush it. You have to make sure you back brush it with a kitchen broom. Um, otherwise, you will see the runs when you go to stain the house. But uh, as long as you back brush that log, you know, you can spray a 40 foot log in, you know, maybe five to seven minutes. You know, sweep it, let it dry. Don't do it in the direct sun, uh, not high heat, anyways. And uh, no, it'll, it'll look great. And then when you go to cut your lateral or your notches, you spray them too. So, I mean, obviously you'd be using this on a, on a spudded log when you first take the bark off to protect it. And uh, yeah. the moment it, it gets warm outside, I mean, we're really in that window right now where you wanna be applying this product, the TimberTech on, on the end cuts, on the butt ends before. Yeah, I mean, I thought I'd be applying it two weeks ago, but yeah, it snowed today. It did. It was actually yeah. <laughs> snowing 10 minutes ago here. So yeah. go figure. Right. So this is a product where you want to get it onto the butt ends as soon as possible. I mean, the moment it's not freezing outside, I encourage you to get this on the butt ends to prevent that um, fungal activity from firing through and causing that blue stain. And then once you get the, the bark off, get the product on there as absolutely fast as you can so yeah. that uh, you're protecting the wood. So once again, this is going to help protect the the wood from not only blue staining but also from uh, intensive prep work. If you're having those logs out there for a couple months, I mean, they're going to start. Yeah, you know, there, there's nothing worse than seeing a couple loads of logs go blue. Yeah, it's uh, especially pine. Yeah, yeah, disheartening. Yeah, so easy to apply, really clear product. This is a C20 here that we're working with. So C20 is great for for pine, um, also for the. Um, uh, for cedar as well too. So it's it, the C20 is a clearer formula. The M30 would actually be better for pine because it has a bit of a whitish tinge to it. It's a little bit more fortified. So uh, the M30 for pine, C20 for cedar. And um, easy product to apply. You're, I mean, basically just flood coating on. You could use a backpack sprayer or a, or a flood coater and um, you're getting on as much as you can onto the surface of the wood and then back brush it uh, to make it even with, uh, you're saying you're using a big broom yeah, 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 we just use a kitchen broom. Yeah, yeah, easy. So awesome product to preserve the log. So, um, and once again, this is unique, this formula, because it doesn't leach out of the wood over time. It really stays inside the wood and uh, and helps it protect it for, for, for as long as you need it to before you get around yeah, to the like logs. Basically good for the summer yeah. anyways. Yeah, um, I have a really interesting slide to show you once we're done. I have a, a recap of the product. And there's a, a specific image that you'll see where uh, a ring just outside of the, uh, the edge of the wood um, in the sapwood is held back the blue stain that fired from the, basically the, just outside of the heartwood through the sapwood and just stopped right below the surface of where the timber tech was applied. So um, you'll see that a little bit later in our presentation. So that's timber tech. Okay, next one up here is the end seal. Yeah. Hopefully we're not making too much of a mess in your kitchen here. <laughs> uh, 
to use this piece again. All right, so the end seal, you can see how, uh, hopefully you can see how white it is. Um, interesting, when you apply this product, it, um, just give me a second, I'm gonna get a brush going. Here we go. Perfect. Thank you. So the end seal is a really high build, um, or high, I should say, it really fills the grain of the wood with um, a formula that's really designed to help protect the uh, the end grain of the wood. Really uh, waxy finish when it's finished, so or when it's dry. Looks a little bit white when you first apply it, but I can assure you that once it's on there and dry, it actually clears up substantially, um, almost entirely clear. So. Um, this has a really nice waxy feel to it. So in fact, if you're using the end seal to also lubricate some of the logs to move around, um, it does a great job of, of that as well too. So, um, but really criti critically, it's an easy product to apply. I know you're using a real unique formulation right now where it's like turpentine and uh, linseed wax. oil and paraffin. Yeah. So okay. can we apply Classic one, two, three over top. So of good question. So this this would be a standalone product. The end seal would be used on its own. It wouldn't absorb anything afterwards because it's highly water repellent. Um, but if you wanted to work with a system that was um, going to be applied to the surface and to the end grain, I just recommend using that product on, on the end grain as well too. So, uh, but this is a great product to use on those butt ends before maybe you've de-sweated or. Or it'd be, it'd be good in notches. Yep. 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 But uh, it's really going to help protect the wood from drying out and cracking and checking. So it's going to help with that moisture balance. And a uh, unique feature of this product as well, too, that it's still actually um, somewhat permeable. So we're not trapping the moisture in the wood. It still has a ability to, to breathe, but in a, in, a, in a controlled fashion where you're not trapping the moisture in the wood. And really easy product to apply. And also doesn't have a bad smell to it at all compared to probably what you're using, eh? Yeah, yeah no smell. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I like the smell of turpentine. All right. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's the uh, that was the Timber Tech product, the C20M30. And then we talked about the end seal protecting the uh, the butt ends. Um, I wanted to talk about a new product that we just recently launched called Wood Force. So Wood Force, let me just get uh, set up here. Yeah, this one's open. Okay. So I'm gonna slide this guy right here. Okay. So wood force is a system that's designed to allow the wood to really gray out over time. And um, it's going to protect the wood from uh, discoloration due to moisture. Um, very highly water repellent formula. And we now recently introduced a, a, a wood force in, a, in an intermix system. So we have seven standard colors that you can intermix um, according to a formula that we've come up with on the product data sheet. There's some 20 some odd colors there to, to choose from. And the objective is that rather than waiting for the wood to gray out, you can create a beautiful vintage or barn, barn board tone on the wood and, um, and get that really cool, you know, Mount Montana uh, cabin that's been out there for years, that, that look, that nice silver gray look um, without, uh, without waiting for it really. So you can get that look right off the hop. And it's also, it's, it's an important, um, uh, product because there are situations where, for example, you might have a very large overhang and um, the wood can't uh, gray out because it's not exposed as much. So having the intermix system achieves that uniformity on the project. And I think you're actually planning on using it on your uh, daughter's project coming up. Yeah. Yeah, instead of uh, spraying her house with the uh, foundation after we add it, we're going to uh, go with the Wood Forest Thunder. And that'll be the exterior. Should be nice and easy and it'll look great. So what we're gonna show you here is how wood force is, um, so how it's mixed. So um, we have, like I said, seven standard um, colors that are pre-mixed. And according to the uh, formula, you're either mixing two parts of a certain color with clear or two colors together to create a, a unique color. So uh, this color that we're going to make up is called slate gray and it's 50% uh, clear, 50% of the light gray, I believe. There we go. So we have a really cool mixing bucket that's transparent and has the um, guides on the side. So it really makes it pretty easy to 
to mix. And, uh, you know, the really neat thing about this wood force system. You're leaving that here too. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> pretty sure you're going to be pulling out all these samples. Uh, really neat thing about wood force is that um, uh, this is a sacrificial coating. So once again, you know, really easy to maintain because ultimately it's allowing the wood to gray out, but it's protecting it against that damage that's caused by water that typically causes the wood to go black or, you know, really dark, um, dark brown due to moisture damage. So, um, yeah, so it's a it's it's an exciting system for us to be uh, working with. And let me just throw some in here. Uh, mix it 50-50. We're literally mixing wood force in Matt's kitchen. I mean, this is yeah. It doesn't get better than baking, unless you're using wood force. <laughs> okay. My wife gave us some uh, two mil poly to put out over top of the tablecloth. It's yeah. all good. Okay. So we're going to apply this on um, a, uh, a piece here that Matt actually asked uh, earlier today. So move this aside. Just get the lid on our wall. So what, maybe you want to talk about adzing uh, a little bit, Matt, here, because one of the things that I love about adzing is that you're using a, a sharp blade to slice open the wood cell structure. And from a coating manufacturer's perspective, that's perfect because you can allow the product to really absorb and grab the wood. And um, I mean, you're not having to sand it, of course, you're using with a freshly open surface at that point. Yeah, and you know what, we've, uh, we've come to the conclusion that some houses it's actually quicker to add it than it is to sand it sure like it all depends on uh, how rough the sawing was um, because you know our wall logs they're never planed they're always rough sawing but uh you definitely got a you know you got a unique finish mm -hmm. yeah yeah before we actually apply the product i wanted to share an example with you where's my little piece here i had um there's a little one. Ah, here we go okay so um, this is a little, I'm going to come around to the camera and show you this in, in just a moment. So here we have a piece that was um, uh, peeled. peeled, right? So it had a unique profile to it. And uh, it's a piece from a project in Montana. And you can see how the coating's really peeled off here. So the coating was applied some year, a year, a year and a half ago. Same product was applied to the end grain and also to the surface. And you can see how it's completely peeled off here. And yet, on the end grain, it's still performing, or was performing when they cut this chunk off. And the reason why it did so well on the end grain is, of course, it penetrated. But on the peeled surface, they didn't do a very good job of preparing that surface, and the coating has completely just peeled off there. So, you know, the the one challenge there with this project was they were afraid to sand it and to maintain the profile, the unique profile of the of the uh, the peeling. And I can tell you, you know, I've I've done a few projects myself. You can sand around uh, a profile like that using um, uh, an, a random orbital sander. We've used uh, Porter cable random orbital units with uh, um, they're basic. They look like a grinder, and you can put a random orbital head on the, uh, as an attachment on the end, and you can manipulate that head to work with the contours of the wood very successfully. So, you know, in this in this case here, we had sanded it and um, using 60 grit and it opened the wood grain right up and you can see how much uh, more product it, it absorbed and uh, and this you know this is going to perform so um, once again it's possible to prep sand um, a peeled surface like this or an ad surface like this if you're willing to work with the contours of the wood granted that would be in a situation where maybe they've allowed the wood to really um, uh, go too long between maintenance coats, right? So, you know, where coating might perform six to eight years between maintenance coats, if you let it go 10 years and it's really starting to deteriorate and you've gone, you've let it go too far. At that point, that's where you're gonna have to get more aggressive with the prep sand. So let's say uh, I didn't get a coating on the uh, as service right away. Yeah. And uh, it was starting to discolor. Right what would I use to oh, like clean it? Thank you. So we have a product called Wood Wash and the Wood Wash can actually uh, be used to remove the uh, grayed surface or the dead lig lignin that's that's grayed out. Uh, it's a two-stage process. You use a neutralizer lightener as a second coat or a second um, uh, step in that process. 
and it really helps lighten and brighten the surface and also remove all of that dead lignin. Now, granted, after using that, it's really going to chew into the wood grain. You might get a bit of a grain raising, so still wouldn't be a bad idea to take a sander and go over the surface, uh, not aggressively, but just enough to, to remove any of that uh, grain raising that, that might right. happen because of the washing. So, okay. yeah. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get the wood force onto this. Got my brush ready. Got our wood force mixed up in our mixing pail. And I really want you to, uh, you know, pay it. Hopefully you're paying attention to how heavily we're applying the product because, you know, there's something to be said about preparing the surface well, but also applying to the, uh, applying the right dosage um, to the point of refusal is critical as well too. And as Matt, Matt was saying earlier, you know, you really don't want to be applying these kind of products in the direct sunlight because they can flash dry and form a film. I can show you a, an image of that a little bit later. And, um, you know, that's, uh, you know, that's, that's just one of the challenges with working in the yard. You know, you, you not, you might not have the shade to work with. So you might need to get out there early in the day or late in the day so that you're not working in that direct sunlight so that uh, the coating has a chance to really soak in the wood before it hits, uh, you know, any sort of direct sunlight. Um, Mike, we're, Mike, we're seeing the other board mostly instead of seeing what you're doing. Oh, shoot. That's not. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. So just applying the wood force there. How's that? Yes, we can see that better. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> All right, so that's wood force. Can you tip? Can you tip the board though towards the camera? Yep. Okay. Go ahead, Matt. Come on over. There's wood force. You can see, still see, you know, some transparency there. It um, it's not going to look like a like a stained piece necessarily. You know, once again, the the objective here is that you're going to have a coating that has a nice vintage look to it. It's going to gray out really nicely and evenly over time. And most importantly, it's going to protect the wood from going black due to moisture damage. So um, really unique offering from, from Sanson. I think we're a, a leader in, in, especially in this um, segment, we uh, I think we're first to market with something like this. So it's an exciting part or exciting product for us to be, to be launching. All right. So there's one other product I wanted to touch on and Matt, you can hopefully show us around here a little bit because it's, it's on all the walls. Oh, the purity. Yeah. So I'm going to grab the camera and I'm going to let you show us. So this is a uh, purity interior clear over top of uh, classic espresso. But uh, yeah, what do you want me to say? About it? <laughs> you spray it on? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Matt's not a ceiling guy. <laughs> All right. So purity interior clear is uh, a product that allows the wood to um, really show its brilliance. And it's a, it's a warm finish that uh, has a lot of life to it. It shows some almost like a holographic effect in the wood where it just lets the depth of the grain show through. It's a warm, um, warm finish. Now, that's for a specific type of client that wants that warm look in their wood, right? But some people want a non-yellowing finish that uh, maintains the freshly sanded nature of pine or maple, in which case we have a product called Glacier, and that's a non-yellowing finish. But um, what I wanted to demonstrate here is our uh, Purity Interior Clear, and that has a beautiful amber amber tone to it. But it makes it easier to uh, wipe to, to wipe dust off, makes it easier. Now, you know what I didn't do here? I didn't shake this like I did with everything else, but I need to stir it. You don't have not to stir stick, do you? So uh, this is a good learning moment, hopefully for everyone. Um, if you're working with clear coats for the interior, um, you don't ever really want to shake the interior clear coats because they're a fine finish. They form a film on the wood. And uh, that's perfect. Thank you. Are you yeah. sure I can use this? Yeah, it's not a piece that. of your home that Ali's waiting to be installed somewhere. It is a overhead. piece of doorstop. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's gonna have a nice clear finish on it now. So um, where was I going with that? So the, the clear finishes, you don't want to shake them because you're going to introduce little micro bubbles in the finish. So always recommend uh, just stirring them up uh, before you use them. Thankfully, this was freshly made product, so uh, I really don't have to stir it up much at all. 
And you can see how white that might look when you, uh, you know, dip it in there really heavily. But once you brush it back, you can see how much clearer that looks. There we go. So it's hard to appreciate how, how nice this looks um, when you're first applying it, because of course, um, any sort of that uh, purple hue to it, um, that, that purple hue really dissipates as it dries out. So um, allows the wood to really shine through. So here we go. We're going to apply some of it on this uh, piece right here. And what I like about the purity interior clear as well, too, is that it can work with uh, some moisture pockets in the wood. I mean, yes, it's an interior finish. It's not meant for uh, wet wood per se, but uh, it has the ability to work with some moisture. And, uh, and that's great for timber frames. It's a really durable finish, too, with uh, high solids. So you could use this in as little as two coats and be done with it, whereas some other products might take as many as uh, three or four coats to really finish. We've got a bit of an audience here that you guys can't see <laughs> watching us. Any comments, questions? It's good for cabinets. There we go. There we go. Yeah. Actually, Ali, you know, come on in. This is uh, Matt's wife, Ali. Come on over here. <laughs> Grab your beer. <laughs> I have a question. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if this is the, the first one that's good for green products and most timber framers are using green wood. Yeah. Is this the first one you'd recommend for timber that's at 20 plus percent moisture? Yeah, you can, um, you, you can get away with this product. I'd say 20% is sort of the, the high end. You don't want to go much higher than that. But uh, because, because of the chemistry of the product, um, you know, I've personally seen it work well on many timber uh, packages. So it has that uh, unique ability to work with some, some moisture in the wood. And uh, this would have been over 20% when yeah. we sprayed that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, and uh, this has been on the walls here for 12 years. It doesn't, it hasn't peeled off or blistered or yeah. anything like that. So welcome, Allie. This is Matt's uh, wife and prompt to a uh, guest. Um, Allie, you, you are the cabinet um, uh, maker for Matt Davidson uh, already in my home. So um, you have a chance to work with our stains mm -hmm. and also our clear coats. So if you want to maybe, yeah. you know, you're welcome to, to give some insight as to how you like working with our product. Well, I'm a super fan of the stain. Um, especially so i've been cabinet making for like 30 years mm -hmm. and i've used you know mid wax super stinky you gotta be careful of like overlap and where you stop the brush and runs and stuff i've used mohawk um the rubbing stains also stinky nice product but and you got to do it all by hand and i wanted to find something i could spray and uh, you can't spray min wax. I got some uh, uh, ultra penetrating stain from Mohawk, but then you get the overlap stripes and stuff. Mm -hmm. And with the Sanson, it's no smell. You can spray it. And uh, honestly, a 10 year old can put it on. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter if you get runs or. You just if as long as you're quick and you brush it out or yeah. you spray over it or whatever and it dries in like 20 minutes yeah it's a fast drying product which Super, is great yeah. yeah and you can top coat it so it's all about speed and production and, yeah. and easy to use perfect yeah, yeah. perfect yeah. stuff yeah so our, our zero voc stain um i would say that one of the unique characteristics that set it apart from oil-based coatings like ali said is that it's fast drying so if you're spraying it, it could dry as quickly as five to seven minutes if you're brushing it on 20 minutes or so. And uh, when you first put it on, it looks blotchy, right? It's almost yeah. scary yeah. because it starts drying in spots and you, you're almost tempted to wipe it back, but you just want to let it do its thing, soak in. And uh, you almost put it on like a, like a wood, like a, like an exterior wood stain where you flood it onto the surface mm -hmm. and then you won't get any overlap because you're saturating it, right? So, yeah. and once it's dry, you're ready to go with the clear coat. Yeah, and it yeah. comes out nice and even. Yeah, and you're yeah. ready to top coat it within minutes. Yeah, so um, like Ali said, very even color dispersion, um, very fast to dry, and also it's zero VOC. So yeah. those are three things that a, a, an oil-based stain can't touch. 
Yeah. You know, we, so you're, you're, and, and your co-op student can put it on and not screw it up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. I'll give you a brush for that one. <laughs> All right. So at this point, that's pretty much everything I wanted to touch on um, today. Uh, but I did want to share a couple of slides with you. I'm going to just walk over the um, computer here and, uh, and just launch a quick uh, slideshow that we prepared. Okay, Mac, if you just confirm that you can see that. We can see it. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, so um, just some, some uh, differences about Sanson, uh, just generally speaking here. So we're working with waterborne chemistry and what makes it unique is that we're using highly modified alkyd resins to penetrate the wood cell structure. And this allows us to uh, approach the, the wood coating market with a, a very sustainable, but also very high performing finish that won't crack, chip, and peel. So we're able to penetrate the wood and, um, and, and, and beautify wood and make it a very durable uh, product that's very easy to maintain. So here is a, a, a better example of what we were trying to demonstrate earlier with the water sitting on the surface. So this is just a piece of cedar, mill glazed on the left-hand side, wasn't sanded, the other side was prepped with 80 grit. And you can see how much of a difference uh, that makes really noticeable on cedar. And that effect that you see there, will happen in as little as five seconds uh, after putting some water on the wood. So very dramatic. So I just wanted to mention here, you know, these might be some challenging surfaces to prep because um, this builder in particular um, creates a unique profile in the wood. So like Matt was asking me earlier, you know, what would you do if there is a, if there's a unique profile in the wood? So sanding something like this wouldn't be uh, so much a possibility because you'd be literally losing that unique profiling. That's not a mill glaze that you're seeing there. That's a, that's a unique um, uh, texturizing uh, that they were using. So here you'd use a product like wood wash or even paint stain or, or uh, wood strip to, to prep the surface. So and here's an example of actually a well prepped surface, but where they went wrong was applying the product in direct sunlight. So despite the fact that there's no mill glaze underneath the coating, the, the coating still didn't have a chance to really work its way into the wood because it was applied in the heat of the day and in direct sunlight. So um, as much as we focus on prep, application is also critical. So you wanna make sure that your dosage is appropriate. Um, what that means is six to seven wet mills. If you have a wet mill gauge, you know how to use it. If not, let, let us know and we can get you one. We'd be happy to send one out. And um, also, you know, make sure you're, you're applying the product in appropriate conditions, not in direct sunlight, not in the heat of the day, so that the product can actually dive into the wood successfully. Um, I, I didn't have a chance to really show you our boracol product, but for log and timber, this is a, you know, I think it's a critical product to consider. It's a preservative, um, also has remedial benefits if that's what you're facing on a restoration. So um, effectively, this can, you know, help or, uh, deal with any existing mold or mildew in a log but it also offers performance, sorry, protection against fungal activity and decay um, from future attack um, by way of the 20-2. So before you put the wood stain on there, always consider using boracol, um, if not on the entire shell, at least on the first few logs that might be near the ground. You know, especially critical for environments where there might be a lot of moisture and you know it's gonna be a problematic installation in the future. Will the stain absorb the sand? Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Even if it's just the bottom two are done? Yeah, it's a clear product, yeah. Is that something like a borate salt? Uh, it's, a, it's a borate solution carried by um, uh, um, glycol, um, octo, uh, octahydrate. Uh, probably miss saying it right now, but uh, it's, a, it's a solution that's carried into the wood um, that's a ready to use formula in the can. Um, some projects that I wanted to share with you here are, um, we're going to show some of Matt's projects too. Uh, this is um, Clarny Mountain Lodge um, up in Clarny. Used, I believe, 800 plus logs. Largest log structure in North America, if not the world, um, as far as we know. So um, beautiful uh, banquet and uh, uh, conference center. This is um, up in Huntsville, the G8 Canada Summit Center. Just a nice example of a, a timber frame installation. This is the image of timber tech that I want to share with you. So you can see where the heartwood ends and where the sapwood begins and where the fungal uh, activity or bacteria fire through the wood. And then it's held back right at the edge because of the timber tech product. So 
Um, here we have a more dramatic example. We're using control samples um, that uh, were um, subject to fungal activity and control pieces that had the product applied. You can see how successful that test is. So NCO, we talked about that, um, you know, awesome product for sealing up those butt ends early in the season to help the wood from drying out and cracking and checking and has a really nice waxy um, uh, characteristic to it, which, you know, actually it functions as a nice lubricant if you're moving logs around as well too for where they uh, join or stack on each other. Um, chinking, I wanted to mention our chinking, we didn't have a chance to really demonstrate it. We only have so much time today, but our chinking is a very unique formula in that it won't shrink when it's, uh, when it's curing. So it's a moisture cure product that uses alcohol to spread. And, um, you know, I'm sharing this picture with you because Disney Park had um, singled this formula out um, by Sanson for this installation because of its unique characteristics. So um, very successful product and uh, very durable as well too. If profiled accordingly, you know, you have 400% elasticity and uh, zero, zero shrink um, and cracking. And wood force once again, we already demonstrated that product. So it's available in a, in a really wide assortment of colors. What I think is really the unique part and, and is interesting about wood force is that you can create comes custom vintage tones and, and barn board tones with the product um, right on site because it's an intermix system. Some of our interior stain applied to a project. Some of the clear finish, you can see how it really highlights the warmth in the wood. Nature's oil as well too, great for uh, timber frames if you want that low luster penetrating oil kind of a finish as well too. And that's what I wanted to share with you. I wanted to show you really quickly as well, some of Matt's uh, projects here too. So just bear with me, I'm gonna pull that up quickly. Here we go. So Matt, I don't know if you wanna pick out some of these here to, to share. I thought you were just gonna share the link. Oh, we can do that after. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Or you can just scroll through and maybe point one or two out if you like. So which one do you want to? Actually, it's a, touch, <laughs> it's a touch screen too. You can uh, touch the screen where you like. Right. I think I'll just scroll through and if anybody has any questions, they can ask me. That fire pit pavilion is just awesome. Love that. Yeah, that was pretty cool. They have to line all the uh, timbers with metal, though, so that they mm -hmm. can have a fire in it. <laughs> Interesting. Man, those butt ends are huge. Beautiful. Yeah, we've been using uh, Sanson for ever since we started, but actually, this picture here. This is a picture of a piece on piece we did. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the first year you came out with the classic one, two, three. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And that was all ads by you? Well, uh, not by me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> How do you go back? Here, I think this will do it. Hope. Yeah, there you go. Uh, I think so, yeah. Uh, yeah, so all these, all these timbers have been sprayed with uh, foundation and we just have them outside now. Back. That's what, this is what autumn gold looks like when it's uh, applied inside. Nice. It's uh, Samson's Onyx. Great color. Oh, and there's your uh, trademark. What do you call that? The uh, a lozenge. A yeah. Lozenge. Yeah. Yeah. So we we it. put that in every home, but. Very cool. I like that. I noticed that it's actually in, in your kitchen around here too. Mm -hmm. Yeah.
what's the lifespan on these products and what do you have to do to prep to reapply? Um, I know you've said keep it out of the sunlight, keep good, good temperatures, you know, the standard, let's keep it as close to 70 degrees as we can, but what happens with a, a building that's already up like that, that one that um, you just talked about that looked like a front entryway type thing, the piece on piece. Yeah. So t the question is, uh, Matt, if you want to get in here a little bit, we'll kind of yeah, sure. squeeze in. And I mean, I mean, what I tell clients is, uh, I mean, we, we're using green wood. We use green logs. You know, we buy winter cut wood, but it's well over 30%, you know, when we're building with it. Uh, Sanson does get applied to it right away. And uh, the, south's, the southern exposure, yeah, it's going to need another, you know, refreshing coat in maybe five years. In that five years, it's not going to crack or, or peel or anything. Uh, it's going to have to be washed. But, but the, north, the north side, it could go like 10 or 12 years. Like, it'll still look the same. I mean, that's, that's the experience we've had anyway. But to apply it, yeah, I mean, the stain is applied. It's all with, uh, you can do it with a weed sprayer and a kitchen broom. It's quick. Okay, so we should probably take this uh, chance to get into the Q&A. And uh, um, where should we start? Um, I think there's quite a few questions here in the chat box. So... Mac, do you want to lead this uh, Q and A here? Sure, I, I'd be happy to. Um, I, you want a beer, Michael? Sure. Let's see. Okay. All right. So the I, I thought um, we'd start at the bottom, you know, at the end, and go to the go to the first. So so let's go last last in first out. How long will the boracol insect repellent work in high humidity climate? Okay. Right, so it's a type of product that um, when, it's, when, when it's once applied to the wood, um, unless it's leaching out due to a lot of post wetting, it really should stay in the wood for the lifetime, um, barring that you're maintaining the coating that's protecting it over top. So once boracol is applied, it, does, it, it doesn't function as a standalone finish. It does need a protective uh, coating used over top to prevent water from leaching it out of the wood ultimately. So. Um, to answer the question, really, it could be indefinite as long as you're staying on top of the protective coating on top. And, and does it work well in high humidity? Absolutely, yeah. It's um, it, it's a it's a product that can seek out moisture in wood if there happens to be some already, and it'll migrate to those areas. But uh, uh, there's no reason why it can't work in high humidity. Okay. Uh, regarding wood forest, is that an opaque stain? Right, so wood forest is designed to offer a uh, um, sacrificial type of coating that grays out over time. So the, the, the colors that we offer um, have a certain amount of transparency to them. It's certainly not an opaque finish and they're designed to, to still weather out and gray out over time. So I like to say it's a bit of a dynamic color where um, you're allow allowing the beauty of the wood to show through and, and that nice silver finish is, is, is showing. So it's certainly not an opaque finish. It, is it a form, um, you know, does it form a film? Do any of these products form a film? Do all of these products form a film or are they simply soaking into the wood? Right, so generally speaking, if we're talking about classic SDF deck, um, timber tech, they're, they're using a, an alkyd, a highly modified alkyd technology that's um, penetrating into the wood with water as the vehicle. Once that water evaporates and leaves the wood cell structure, it leaves behind the res resin inside the wood. So these are these are fully penetrating treatments and coatings. Um, however, we do have finishes that can form a film on the wood as well too. For example, like ENS, um, that forms a barrier on the surface of the wood. It's unique because it's formulated not um, in, in a way that it forms a hard, brittle surface. It's elastomeric. It can move with the wood. It can still remain slightly permeable so it's not trapping the moisture in the wood so really i mean if you're if you're looking for that matte penetrating finish we have that but if you want that film built finish as long as the wood is dry enough to use it we can certainly uh, do that as well too with the ens product 
what is the best way to wash? Low pressure, um, low pressure uh, pressure washer, or or what, how would you advise? Washing? Right. Um, I mean, there's a lot of answers to that question, but just generally speaking, I don't think you want to go too high a pressure because you could be busting up the wood fibers, so you'd be effectively um, uh, blasting away the the softwood and leaving the hardwood behind. And if you do it enough, uh, you're going to get ridges in the wood. Um, so, I mean, I personally don't think the pressure washing is, is really the, um, the best way because you're introducing a lot of wood as well, or water into the wood. You're getting into the cracks and checks as well too. So um, if, if possible, stick to sanding, but I mean, pressure washing is fine, but you just have to make sure that you're allowing enough time for the moisture to evaporate and work its way out of the wood before you even consider putting on the stain at that point. I see. With the wood wash, we've had uh, pretty good luck with using a scrub brush on a four foot broom handle. Yeah, actually, yeah. So I feel to mention that our wood wash is a, is a great way to tackle those those uh, surfaces where they've really grayed out and you're looking for a nice clean surface to begin with. Um, that, that wood wash is a chemistry where you're using the first step to, you know, work away the dead wood fiber. Uh, and then the second step is to neutralize and to lighten the wood. Um, and as I mentioned previously, you still need to sand that that wood afterwards because you're going to get some grain raising as it chews into that wood. Uh, if you want a nice smooth finish. Okay. Uh, can you speak to the advantages of uh, water-based over oil-based products? Right. So we're different from water-based because we're waterborne. Um, water-based products, traditionally speaking, are using acrylic and latex. At a molecular level, they're larger. They're, they typically form a film on the surface of the wood. So those water-based coatings have good UV performance. They're low in VOCs. They dry very quickly. Um, but if not maintained, um, they can crack, chip, and peel. They're, they can become challenging to maintain. They're good products, but they certainly um, have their limitations. Oil-based products, on the other hand, have very good flow. They're beautiful. They penetrate. Um, I mean, we know that they have high VOCs, or at least they used to, um, but they also have a tendency to trap moisture um, by, by nature of their chemistry. So not always good for logs, especially green logs. So waterborne technology is unique because it delineates between water-based um, based on the fact that it's using water-soluble alkyl technology. So these are natural oil resins that are highly modified to penetrate into the wood cell structure. So Waterborne is very different from acrylic latex water-based product because we're still using natural alkyd resins. So they have that oil feel to them, that oil look, that penetration um, without the downside of VOCs and also with the upside and low environmental footprint of water-based product. Okay. We're going to take a right turn here. Um, the, do you, do you, have you, as Matt, ever used a Makita in like a Makita brush sander uh, for uh, any any of the work with the contouring, or uh, you you uh, mentioned also that uh, that person who or that company that that does that high that high finish that high uh, tactile finish. Um, you, have you used have you used uh, uh, wheel brushes for that? Yeah, I've used wheel brushes on uh, reclaimed timber. Like that that's the only place I've used a wheel brush. And it worked great. And, and, and why did you use it there? Just because of the, uh, the hand hewn finish that was 100 years old. It, it was uh, rough and there was no way that we could clean it and keep it looking just the way it was without using the wheel brush. Like the wheel brush did work great. Okay. And, and, and it could take a finish after that too. Is that an Osborne brush? No, it's a uh, Makita wheel sander. So okay. it's got like a 80 grit gotcha. nylon wheel on it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, that worked great. I'm going to double back, um, Mike, on this. Uh, it's a, the, the person is asking what is the difference in penetration between waterborne and oil? Going back to that last question the difference between waterborne and oil in penetrating. Hope, hope that's okay. clear. Okay, yeah. Um, I mean, it, I, I'm not a chemist. And I'm not about to pretend to be one. So, I mean, I can't tell you how many microns more an oil-based penetrates versus uh, a waterborne finish. Um, I think it's a bit irrelevant, actually, because as long as you can get into the wood cell structure, 
you've done the job of protecting the wood from moisture intrusion, dimensional stability, um, which is caused by moisture migrating into the wood cell structure and causing it to shrink and swell, right? So as long as you can protect that very first layer, then you've done the job. Okay, All right. that makes sense. Um, did, I, I, did I ask this question here? Is, is wood force an opaque stain? Yeah, we covered that. Okay. So we do have a... Uh... Yeah, that's perfect. So these samples were done yesterday. And this is wood force. So you can still see the grain. Right. Yeah, that, that seems like a, a, a good selling point, it would seem to me that you still, it's not a paint, it doesn't look like a paint. No, it's not a paint at all. Right. No. Yeah, it doesn't cover the wood like, like a paint does. Yeah. Um, here's a question for you, um, for you guys. I, I, I'm not sure who, who will be able to better answer this question. Any special recommendation for checks and splits? Hmm. I know where I stand on that. You want to go first? Yeah, you're thinking the end sealer. Um, right? Well, are we talking about the checks on on the surface of the log? Or are we talking about the the log ends, the butt ends? Well, splits would be at the butt ends, and checks would be on the on the surface, wouldn't they? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well. Yeah, if it splits in the butt end, to me that's like a wind crack. I, I don't know. That's how uh, I look at it with white pine anyways. Um, in the side, and it will go to the end grain anyways. Yeah, so, so if you're just trying to protect the wood that's inside of the splitter, the check, okay. is there any yep. point to doing that? Is there anything yes. that you would use? Absolutely, yeah. So it's, it's critical that as the wood dries out in the first few years, um, if we're talking about green wood, you're gonna get newly open surfaces. So if you've done a really great job of applying the finish to that surface and you get cracks and checks, which are going to happen, um, it's important to come back even after year one to uh, get product into those open surfaces, open cracks and checks so that you're getting fresh coating in there or fresh treatment in there. Um, if let's say we fast forward 10, 15 years and you have some major cracks and checks that have happened, um, my, my, personal opinion on that is that you should avoid putting epoxy in there or even putting chinking in there because you could potentially create a moisture pocket where you're trapping moisture where it's not able to get out. So, um, you know, quite frankly, if you can clean it out and get as much stain into that open uh, area, then that's better going, that's, that's going to be a better protector for the wood. It's going to allow it to perform better over time. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that stay away from epoxy is really good advice. That's my, yeah. that's my my feeling on that matter. Um, uh, absolutely. Yeah, too much trouble. Would you put the bar call inside those checks with splits before you do anything? Is there any? You sure place? could. Yeah. Would, would that be advantageous? It would be. Yeah. As long as you get something over top of it to to, to help protect it from leaching out. Yeah. It, um. Diff different topic. Um, is wood ever too dry to properly seal? Is it ever advisable to pre-moisture a really dry surface uh, for optimum absorption? It's a good question. We actually saw that today when we were playing around with the cold wood um, out in the yard. So I, I sanded a piece with 60 grit. Matt saw that we were pouring water on the surface of the freshly sanded piece. And it was so cold outside. I mean, we're looking at two degrees this morning. Yeah. And uh, it really wasn't taking the, the the water. When I got it here, it did make a big difference. So the temperature of the wood um, does play into that as well, too. Um, but to answer the question, um, it, you know, it's a matter of uh, popping the grain uh, with the moisture. It helps create a smoother finish because usually you would pop the grain and sand it and then apply the stain. Um, I know there's a school of thought out there where you can put some moisture uh, down on the surface and then uh, apply the stain afterwards. It seems to sort of migrate um, into the wood, but I think that at that point you're working with a moisture content that's higher. So quite frankly, you're probably not getting it. Um, you're not getting any more product into the wood. So I think we should focus on getting more product into the wood 
and by sanding it with 60 or 80 and, and working with wood that's relatively, you know, not cold, um, would be the best way to go. That would be the, the best advice. That'd be the best practice. Okay. Um, how long will, uh, unopened containers last in storage? And I imagine there are some conditions on the storage. Yeah, I mean, some of the different some of the products will have different shelf life. Um, it could be anywhere from eighteen months to three years, depending on what product you're looking at. Yeah, but even even um, I mean, I've seen some product that's beyond three years, and as long as it stirs up nicely and um, and looks uniform, then uh, then you could still use it. I I would hesitate to recommend something that's been sitting around for you know six, seven, eight years. It's probably beyond its its shelf life at that point. Okay. What? That's good information. Um, if the site just experienced a heavy rain, is it still okay to sand and seal? How long should you wait, especially if the, if daily rainfall is anticipated? Yeah, um, you, you should try to focus on wood that has a moisture content on the surface of 20% or lower. Um, we know that at 25% and higher, you really can't get much into the wood cell structure. So you're wasting product, you're wasting your time at that point. Um, so I would say if you've had rain same day uh, and, and you want to start applying product, I would not recommend it. Um, you should wait at least a day or two, um, you know, make sure it's dry to the touch. Um, and, and you would want a full day, if not two days before you're expecting rain again, um, because the product really, you, you, it might feel dry on the surface, but it might still be drying underneath the surface. So you don't want to compromise it. I see. What is the long-term impact on the wood and or sealer if the owner falls behind on the quote unquote schedule maintenance? Is extra sanding required to catch back up or is there something they can do to catch back up? Yeah, really good question. Um, because we, we do promote proactive maintenance because it's a time saver, it's a money saver. But I hear you, I mean, if it happens that they've let it go too far and maybe it's changed hands and, and the new owner doesn't realize that there should be proactive maintenance applied. Um, you may be in a situation where the coating has eroded or deteriorated to the point where it, it's now going gray. And you would then at that point, you should sand it. So washing it uh, with multi-wash to remove any sort of bacterial or fungal activity on the surface and then sanding it um, so that you're working with a bare, fresh, clean surface would probably be the best route to go. And it seems like sanding is really important. Um, yeah, if we haven't established that already, that is number yeah. one. Yeah. <laughs> really important. Uh, does, does the use of or type of stain affect the absorption of the sealer? I'm not sure if I understand that one. Uh, perhaps the person who wrote the question would uh, like to jump in if they're still here, because um, I can read it, but I'm afraid I, I can't necessarily. Yeah, I'm not sure if I understand that one. Yeah, it, it, in other words, if you put it, I think they're talking about the, the effect of, of stain on sealer or sealer on stain. Uh, earlier, you said that the sealer does not inhibit the stain at all. Um, um, okay, if we're talking about our interior stain and then the clear coat, um, you, you, you need to apply the stain first and then the clear coat because the stain um, absorbs into the wood, colors the wood, dries, and then you're sealing it with the clear coat afterwards. So um, that's the, it's really the only way to do it. Otherwise, if you were to put the stain over top of the sealer, it wouldn't have any wood substrate to go into. Okay. I don't know if that answers the question or not, but... I, I don't know either, <laughs> I'll okay. be honest with you, sorry. Um, when finishing Douglas fir, kiln dried Douglas fir, um, okay, wait a second. Let me check, I flood with stain, then same with SDF. I don't really think, um, I don't, I can't, I'm not even sure. Um, perhaps Oliver Marks is still here and Oliver, you could ask that question. I don't think I really uh, understand the word combination here. Sorry, is it Mac? Yes. Yeah. Hi, Mac. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Hi. I was just saying when I'm when I'm uh, finishing, I typically use the old classic, which is actually what I like, and I use 
the old classic and SPF top coat. So when you have, the question was with checks, um, if you have checks and you're finishing in shop, what I do on in each single surface side is I just flood those checks, allow the stain to dry, flood with top coat, and that way you don't get the discoloration, but if you don't, you know how, um, if you're not penetrating with the stain, so you're not seeing, if you're staining Douglas fir, or even if you're staining pine, then eastern material is somewhat drier. You can get in those um, in those checks, right? You can you can brush it in or you can flood it in. It will dry um, if mm -hmm. you give it the twenty four hours plus. Okay, that makes sense. And Oliver, I, I I'd like to mention that um, we do have the classic zero base in the clear UV av available um, uh, still. It's uh, it's a product that we evolved into classic one, two, three, but if you really do like the original formula, it is still available. You know, I'll say that the one, two, three is, is a more advanced formula. There's more features and, and benefits. It's, a, it's ultimately a better performing product to the tune of some 40 or 50%. It's dramatically improved in performance. The old system was great. The new system is, is a much better performing system. Uh, so if there's an opportunity to use the new system, you know, I encourage you to try it. Um, it is an evolution have, of the original. Yeah, I, ha I have used the, the one, two, three. What I yeah. found though is that in, in some projects, if you're limited to say a two coat application, especially inside, um, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll use classic, the old classic base stain. Sure. And then SD, SDF, either the, the clear top coat or the natural. Yeah. The natural has, uh, has the UV inhibitor, right? Right. Yeah, I could see how that would work for you for an interior setting. Two coats would be yeah. would be plenty as long as the color looks uniform after the first coat. Because of course, classic is a very deep penetrator. So uh, in some cases, just one coat of that might look a little a little blotchy potentially. Um, but as long as you like the color uniformity, that's that's fine. Yeah, I, I found it actually works great. That 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 system I've been using for well, I've been using it for years now, and everybody's happy. Yeah, it, it works well. Yeah, especially with the two coat. Like I said. Yeah. The third, you know, when you have three or four coats, you know, sometimes that becomes uh, um, cost inhibitive. Right. I mean, and, it, here's a client. It can happen. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, the uh, it, it depends on the client. I think that's once again an opportunity to educate the client. So, you know, if sure. if they're really focused on two coats, you know, adding that third coat, um, given the entire cost of the project. It would be uh, it would be a shortfall in performance by not finishing the full application of all three coats. I mean, quite frankly, even with the original classic for an exterior application, we always did recommend two coats of classic and then either a mix of classic and clear UV as the final coat or a tint in the classic clear UV as the third and final coat. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Depending on the color that you're trying to achieve. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah that, that was that's been a tough one. But no, it's great. I have, I haven't had any negative feedback in over 10 years now using that. Wonderful. Good to know. Just longevity, just, just so you know that. Yeah. Thank you, Oliver. Yeah, you're welcome. The, uh, the last question that I, th that we have written down, there may be other questions. The last question we have written down is if the wood is already stained with another product versus bare wood, does the uh, application of the product change? I imagine you're talking about a stain on top of a previously existing stain versus bare wood. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so if you have a previously... You, we, we lost you there for a second. We, we're, we've lost your volume. Mike. Sorry, you broke up there. Oh, okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Right. So if, if there's a previously applied product, it will um, it'll, it'll stop the penetration of our of our product. So you do need bare fresh wood to penetrate into if you're using a, our penetrating finish. However, that leads me to uh, ENS and our ENS product. I can show you a can of it if it's familiar. Right here, the purple flower. So ENS has a unique ability to adhere to um, not just, you know, sickens, but many oil-based coatings. So if you have a, a log or timber that's been uh, coated with 
with Seekins and, you know, it's really built up that film and it has that nice glossy look to it and, but they want to maintain it. ENS is an awesome option to use because we, we've demonstrated that it does adhere to those coatings very well. So long as there's nothing peeling off, because you're only as good as what you're going over top of um, in terms of adhesion. So if it's uh, if it's in reasonable condition, you could use ENS to maintain those old oil-based coatings. And the beauty of that uh, of the ENS is that uh, over time it won't go dark uh, like the oils do. So um, you know it'll lighten up. So uh, easy to maintain. It's um, elastomeric. It can move with the wood rather than becoming brittle and flaking. And uh, if you look at our color brochure, the bottom eight natural colors are all actually mass matched to the uh, to the seconds colors. Interesting. Um, one other question did just pop up. How does your product perform on white oak? White oak uh, for an interior exterior application. Uh, Glenn, for interior exterior application, are you there, Glenn? Exterior, he says or writes. Exterior, white oak, okay. Um, I mean, it, there's no reason why I can't perform well. I think it's a matter of picking the right, the, the most suitable finish for that project. So um, Matt, white oak, have you had any experience with white oak specifically? Not a whole lot, no. Okay. I'd like um, to know based on moisture content as well, because timber with white oak is coming in at 30 plus percent for right. green oak. Is that surface moisture? Yeah. Yeah. I, I'd say that at that point, you need to wait a little bit before you can get something on there because that's, that's still pretty wet. You're not going to get much, uh, if anything, into the surface of the wood there. So it's going to need to dry out a bit. Glenn also asks, would classic be best on the, uh, I believe on the oak? I mean, I, I would, uh, I would go with classic on that application as long as the, uh, the wood is is dry enough to accept it because of course if it's over 25% moisture content the wood cell is saturated with water and you're really not going to get anything into the wood i think i think i could uh, say something on that like when we're using uh, green white pine it's it's probably pushing 35% um you know and it gets stained right away and it's a it's the same you know it's the same cycle. It'll be like five years on the south side, 10 years on the north. Okay. I mean, even with that moisture content, it's still on there. Not as much as it would if it was dry though. Oh, oh definitely yeah. not. Yeah, no. yeah. But uh, yeah. So uh, somebody by the name of Mark says that they've had uh, good results with ENS on the oak. Okay. I could see that too. Yeah, if it's if it's dry, right? I mean, if it's uh, if it's dry enough. So, uh, actually, I think the presentation was very good. Um, I, I I still feel like I'm left without kind of understanding the um, uh, like the chemistry of it, um, and and that to me is the uh, the the most interesting part. Like, how does this stuff really work, and how can we rely upon it? So there may be an opportunity. For uh, future, for future presentations, guys, uh, where we talk a little bit more about the nitty gritty and the, uh, the like the, the various formulations, like like for example, I don't know what alkyd alkyd is or alkyd is. I, I don't even know what okay. that is. Yeah, you know. Right. So, okay. Let me. I, yeah, I, I can. Let me touch on that now. But I would love a part two, and um, but uh, I'm not a chemist. However, in my understanding. You know, an alkyd is a type of uh, resin that's, um, it's a natural resin um, that uh, is, is like an oil in terms of chemistry. So um, molecular size, comparing the oil particle to the alkyd particle to the latex acrylic particle, latex acrylic is much larger. I'm not a chemist, I can't tell you how many times larger, but large enough to the point where latex acrylic um, will form a film, whereas an alkyd is small enough to get into the wood cell structure. So um, it is a small enough molecule that it can penetrate like a true oil because it is a type of oil. And, and those alkyd products, they're less, um, they're, they're less detrimental to the environment, Mike? Um, 
So when we're talking about detriment to the environment, we're, we're mostly focused on VOCs. Right. So those are the volatile organic compounds that are flashing off the surface. They're, they're, uh, they could be used as the vehicles to get, I'm not a chemist, but in my understanding, these are the, these are the things that uh, they're drivers, they're vehicles, but they're flashing off, they're evaporating into the atmosphere or into our respiratory system. So that's really where the VOCs come from. It's the vehicles, it's the drivers. So we're using water as the vehicle. I mean, quite frankly, water is the natural ingredient that carries the resins uh, through the heartwood of trees. So why can't we carry our product into the wood with water? It works. Yeah, and, yeah. well, anyway, I, I was just tossing out an idea. I, I didn't mean to drag you into chemistry tonight at 8.30. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but, but perhaps there is that, that second opportunity for us to... Uh, we would love that. Thank yeah. you. Uh, one, one, one quick question before we go. Should joint ends be sealed before permanently connecting the pieces? With which product? I, I think it's a great idea to mm -hmm. uh, seal the joints. We do that on all our dovetails. Um, we seal them. We have been using like our own mixture of paraffin wax, linseed oil, and turpentine that we heat up, melt the wax, brush it in. And uh, we've had good luck with even the Sanson going over top of that on the end grain of the notch. Yeah, I think that'd be a perfect application for end seal. Yeah, well, yeah. I, I've never tried end seal. Yeah. So I'm going to leave you a gallon here tonight. Yeah. So oh. the end seal. The ANSI would be excellent for that because uh, it's an area where it's not going to be seeing stain, right? So it's uh, it's fully it's 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 um, um, cut off from the application of the stain. So um, it would be a long-term uh, solution to any sort of moisture migration that might get into that end grain. So I would highly recommend using our end uh, end seal on that application. Uh, Matt, when you've used uh, that, that kind of a product, though, you have to be careful on, on not, not allowing it to get beyond those edges, right? I mean, it, otherwise you're yes. not going to be able to seal it. Oh, yeah. yeah. State it, seal it. And, and so there's a, a limit there. You've got to be very careful in the application in some of the yeah, machinery, I would imagine. Yeah, so that, there's a yeah. Bit of challenge. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, go into that question, you know, in, in our shop, we typically use anchor seal for any unseen finish, uh, but we're typically using another product for our finish, so we're using a different type of wax-based sealer, S similar to something that you're using, you know, a mixture of uh, waxes and uh, turpentine and linseed oil. Mm -hmm. but well, we if you... That because we can mix... Uh, a color or a pigment into it if we need to for visible. Yeah, Will, Will if you're using the uh, anchor seal, um, in my experience, I think you're going to really like using our end seal product. It, uh, it applies a little bit easier. Okay. <laughs> well, well, okay. That, it, it was very Does good. That he's going to send him a free sample? Yeah, I, I heard free samples are going around tonight. I heard free samples. <laughs> Caroline, you still there? Yeah, no, I, I. Yeah, exactly. Well, first of all, Michael, yeah, maybe give him your email or put in the chat. But yeah, I work with Michael at Sanson, and certainly, if you would, anyone on this call, if you would like a sample of the product, please, certainly, we'll send you one. Well, we'll make sure and let everybody know that, Caroline. Okay. Yeah, I just put my email in the chat there. So it's ML, like Michael Lima at Sanson.com. And uh, by all means, I have now management approval to provide samples. <laughs> Very good. Okay. I, need, I need about uh, 150 gallons to we'll finish talk. this house. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they need <on> samples. <laughs> yeah, I take samples of 55 gallon drums. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, well, well Matt and um, and Mike and you too, Carolyn. Uh, thank you very much for a great presentation tonight. Kept a, a lot of people interested till eight forty two. So uh, uh, thank thank you, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And and we'll talk about part two at some point here. Awesome. Cheers, guys. Cheers. 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 Yeah. Cheers. Thank you, Mike. Put this together.
We'll see you guys another night. Okay. Thank Good you, night, folks. Missed you, so. Good night.